We good back there? All right. Welcome to uh, our Life of Christ uh, workshop here at uh, West Houston Bible Church. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming out and joining us. We uh, we've had some challenges with the weather, uh, which has kind of been a little bit of a blessing for me because I was expecting like 50 people out here, and I only see like one. Now there's what 10 or 12. So anyway. Um, Let's uh, let's talk a little shop before we get started. Uh, the uh, for those that are uh, live streaming, if you go to the Dean Bible homepage and you go to the news link, it's at the top. I think it's one or two links over. It says news. Click on that. Um, that'll take you to the news page. And then over on the right side of the news page, you will see um, a DM2 Life of Christ icon. Below that, I believe there's a link. You click on that link, and that'll take you to a description of what we're going to do with our workshop, as well as uh, you'll have the student manual, which you need if you're participating in this, um, as well as the schedule. And the schedule has um, the schedule has uh, the page numbers that correlate with what we're teaching up here. So some people have a desire sometimes to get a little bit ahead of uh, the studying, and if you wanted to do that, you've got everything laid out for the whole conference, uh, what we'll be doing. So anyway, um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, I think, probably the hardest question to answer when we talk about uh, disciple makers. By the way, does everybody have a uh, student manual here that's in the, uh, they're over here in a box if you need them. Does anybody need one? Judy, you got one? Perfect. Ladies, okay. So, um, the uh, one of the hardest things to do is describe what, what exactly uh, is a DM2 workshop. I, I remember uh, when, when uh, I first started talking to Brett a year and a half, two years ago about this, you know, I, I, I kept asking him, well, what is a workshop? You know, what exactly happens? And he's like, well, Jeff, you know... It's really hard to describe, and, and I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, here's a guy with the gift of communication. He can't explain to me what this thing is, right? So, but now, having been through a couple, I understand. It's very difficult to explain what we're going to do here. And so I thought I would give it a shot, um, and I've got, uh, I've got a slinky with me to help demonstrate what a DM2 workshop is, or at least the concept, what we're trying to do. And what we're trying to accomplish. So, um, the um, if you guys have your Bibles, let's let's scoot over to Isaiah fifty five eleven. Isaiah fifty five eleven. And so, <clears throat> we'll start in verse ten. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout. And furnishing seed to the to the sower and bread to the eater. So will my word, which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. And so I think if you if you look at what DM two does and what this workshop's intended to do, um, I think Isaiah fifty five eleven is what leads us in our little slinky here, right? Because it's God's Word. That's what this workshop's about. It's not about Jeff teaching or Brett teaching or Gary teaching or Clay. Um, we're kind of incidental to the matter. But what really counts, and if, if we're doing our job right, is we're going to get our, our focus, uh, everyone's focus here that's listening in the live stream audience on God's Word in, in a really, really intense way, right? And so that's where the power is. It's where the focus of this uh, ministry is. Um, that's where the success of this workshop comes from. It's from God's Word. So let's, uh, let's jump over quickly to uh, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. 2. And Eddie, did we get the uh, mics working for the audience? Okay, Brett, can you, would you read uh, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, uh, please? Sorry to put you on the spot. That's all right. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. 
It's in the New Testament somewhere. There it is. Um, <laughs> and the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So, so here we have Paul, and, and I think he's in prison right now. He's probably pretty close to dying. He's writing a letter to Timothy, and he's, in, he's trying to encourage his dear friend Timothy. And, and he tells Timothy, hey, take the things that I've taught you and go out and teach those to gifted men. Wait a minute, is that what Brett said? What was that word, Brett? Faithful. Oh, faithful men. Right? Not gifted. Right? So, so Paul's encouraging Timothy, hey, I want you to go out and share this basically with everybody that's sharing your faith. Um, and so that's one of the focuses um, that we have here at, at the DM2 workshop is um, we want to encourage and teach faithful men. And, and I think the word there is anthropos. So we're talking about men and women. Um, you know, there's not a distinction in that passage uh, where, where Paul's encouraging Timothy, right? And so, so we've, got, we've got the Word of God leading us, and then we've got faithful men and women coming along. By the way, has everybody here seen, you know how a slinky works, right? It goes here. I don't have stairs to demonstrate. But uh, anyway, so we have, we have the word leading us, and then we have faithful men and women that are listening, right? And so, so the next question is, well, well, what do we do? You know, we've come to your workshop now, Brett. What, what do we do with um, what we've learned? So let's, let's, flip over to, uh, let's, fl- let's flip over to Colossians 3.16 real quick. Larry, you want to, can I put you on the spot? It's, it's not in the Old Testament. <laughs> 3 verse 16. And speak up, we got some uh, speakers right up here that need to pick up your voice. Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and accomplishing one another in psalms and hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So, so now that that uh, we've established that the the main priority, the focus of this workshop is God's word, and we're all attending. We're all the faithful men and women that are attending. What do we want to do with this? And here we have this encouragement in Colossians to go out and teach. And, and by the way, um, this encouragement is given to the church. It's not given to men. It's not just given to women. It's not given to adults. It's, it's given to the church. And so the, the concept behind DM2 is that we take God's Word and we teach it to faithful men and women, Right? And then, this isn't going to work out too, hopefully what happens is you will in turn take it and do the same with God's Word, right? And that leads forward like this. And so there you have disciple makers multiplied with my slinky. If I had a a little thing to do this, that would have worked out better. But anyway, that's really kind of what, um, why we're here. Um, A lot of, uh, we've got a couple speakers, we're going to have Brett Nasworth, we've got Gary Smith, we've got Clay Ward, we've got Robbie Dean, who's not here yet, we've got Quentin McCart from Dallas, and we got Cody. Um, Cody came up from the Valley, and is that, that's everybody, right? Um, And so, we'll all be up here at different times teaching, Um, and um, so anyway, let's, uh, before we get started, let's talk a little bit about how we um, approach God's Word here. Hmm. Went away. I always, uh, I always make fun of Robbie for having uh, technical difficulties up here. And here I am with my own little set of difficulties. Ah, thanks. Okay, F5. Perfect. All right, so uh, what we're going to do here is talk a little bit about how we approach God's Word. 
And, and really, um, anytime we do anything in God's Word, it, um, w- whether, it's, whether it's learning, um, whether we're praying, whether we're studying the Bible, whether we're out just living our life, we have two options. We can, either, we can either be having fellowship or we can not be having fellowship. And, and those two concepts, you know, the having fellowship and not having fellowship, let's talk a little bit about uh, what having fellowship is, right? Um, and it's walking by the Spirit, and then it's abiding. And as we go along, I'll, I'll get into a, a, a little bit more about what each one of these are. But the thing that gets in the way of us having fellowship um, is sin. And so, um, even though this looks like a really holy audience... I'm sure no one in here has sinned in the last 30 minutes, um, but I know I need a little confession. So what we, when I'm up here, I always start everything with just First uh, John 1 9. It's a moment of silent prayer, and then I'll open us up in prayer, um, and and then we'll get started. Father, we, uh, we're grateful and thankful for this opportunity to share your word. Uh, we pray that you'd bless this workshop. Um, we thank you for uh, the safe travel that got everybody here in the weather. Uh, we're grateful for the teachers that came forward, and uh, we're grateful for these uh, students that have come forward that want to listen to your word. Uh, we pray that you would guide this with your spirit um, and keep our focus on, uh, on your word and on your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, whose name we pray. Amen. Um, escape. All right. How come it's not... Uh, there we go. Showing up, Brett. You want to come up here and give me a hand, please? This we went from a. This is a different mode. I had practiced this, but we came into a different mode here, okay. called presenter mode. Close down this. Close that. Okay. Now is that in presenter mode? Perfect. Perfect. All right. Sorry about that. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, so let me ask, who, who here um, has ever been to, uh, to a play? Anybody? Okay, great. Everyone. I love it. Um, I've been to a couple. I haven't been to see my favorite one. My favorite is, uh, so far, is uh, one with Shakespeare, uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Um, and I've seen it on uh, in the movies with Denzel Washington and I think Kenneth Branagh. And uh, it's a really, I think the screenplay that they did was really true to what Shakespeare did, uh, from what I know of it. And it was really fun. It was great watching it. And, and um, you know, you watch all this drama and intrigue unfold on the screen and Yet, you know, somewhere behind the scenes is a writer, in this case Shakespeare, that, that's creating this uh, drama. And, and, and uh, Shakespeare has complete control over his characters. Um, and so he gets to orchestrate the play as he wants as he's writing it. And it's really kind of from that perspective that I want to open up and, and start talking a little bit about um, the backdrop to the life of Christ. And, and, and we're going to talk about, there's about a 400-year period of silence between when Malachi finished the Old Testament, and when our Lord Jesus came on the scene. Um, and um, what I'm going to cover is all the things that are going on uh, during that time period. And, and so we're going to call this, um, this is going to be our own little play called The Fullness of Time. Um, the big difference here is that uh, our playwright, our, our, our Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father, they're making all these things happen. They're actors, our leaders, um, nations, individual believers, 
But um, they're doing all this while all of those people collectively and individually have their own volitions, right? And yet still, our Lord works through history to bring about a time that was perfect for His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to step into history. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, we'll start with kind of an overview um, of this. And, and so we'll do the, um, this is the period between the Old and the New Testament. We call it the 400 years of silence. And, and even though we, we have silence here, um, during these 400 years, there was prophecy. So 400 years of silence, mm, I, uh, I say it's a little, I'd use a different word. But uh, anyway, so the 400 years during which God did not speak through any prophet extended from the end of Malachi to the announcement of John the Baptist's birth in Luke chapter 1. During God's 400 year silence between the Old and New Testament, world domination shifted from east to west. At the close of the Old Testament in 435 BC, Malachi wrote his book. The Medes and the Persians were the world's dominant empire. By the time Jesus Jesus was born, Rome dominated the world. During these 400 silent years, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came into existence, and the nation Judah adopted new traditions that impacted many New Testament teachings. God worked during these 400 years so that Christ came in the fullness of time. And that's a Galatians 4.4 4 reference there, um, that uh, fullness of time. So just a quick note, um, those of you that have the uh, student manuals out there, you'll notice as we go through, um, each sentence has uh, a word missing in it. And you know, a lot of people are put off a little bit by that because it kind of forces you into... Um, into keeping track of what's going on. But I think Brett can testify to this, and I know I can. I've, I've been through a couple now of these, but um, no one sleeps during these um, workshops. And, and, and I know there's people, I know myself personally, the first time I heard about 36 hours sitting down in a chair, you know, for me, 10 minutes in a chair, and it's nap time. <laughs> but but this, uh, this really worked well, and it keeps, uh, keeps you engaged. And so what we try to do... Um, you know, we we try not. It's not. We're not up here trying to emphasize any words. The missing words have no significance beyond they kind of complete the thought, and it keeps you engaged. And so, hopefully, um, we'll have the same success here. So, um, let's do uh, let's do the backdrop here to um, the fullness of time. Act one. So several important events reshaped the world during these 400 silent years. You had the Media-Persia rule from 539 to 330 B.C. Um, In 539 B.C., a two-nation coalition between Media and Persia conquered Babylon. Of the two nations, Persia was the stronger. Daniel was in exile in Babylon uh, during this time, and uh, Daniel 7 talks a little bit about this. The um, from 400 or from 500 to 448 BC, Persia and Greece waged war several times. Persian king Xerxes, um, the son of Darius the First, Daniel nine one, attacked the Greeks in 480 BC. At the Battle of Thermopylae, a narrow pass into the Greek. Mainland King Xerxes conquered the Greeks. Later, they defeated him at the Battle of Salamis. These wars, these wars, caused the Persians and the Greeks to hate each other. Sorry, I'm skipping some slides here. I had a little problem with our presentation. Uh, the Greek. Greek, let's talk about Greek rule and influence from uh, 330 B.C. to, three, to uh, 63 B.C. The shift in power from east to west began with the rise of King Philip of Macedonia, part of Greece. When the, 
When King Philip came to power, he united the formerly independent Greek cities and islands into one strong nation. After the assassination of King Philip, possibly devised by his wife, his 20-year-old son, Alexander, came to power. Because of his many brilliant military conquests, Alexander gained the title of Alexander the Great. In 333 B.C., Alexander the Great, the goat that never touched the ground in the vision of Daniel 8, advanced into Persian territory from the west and began to drive back the Persians. Let's, uh, let's stop here real quick, and let's, let's jump over to uh, Daniel 8. And let's take a look at what our little, our divine playwright, not little, but our divine playwright has to say about this. So we, we've, got, uh, we've got Daniel 8. I'm starting in verse 18, so I'm, I'm skipping over a little bit of context here, but just, uh, just for the purpose of time to keep us on track, I'm, I'm going to go through uh, what Gabriel says to uh, Daniel about what we just read about from history. Okay, so here we go. Um, now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood me upright, and he said, Look! I am make, making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. For at the appointed time the end shall be. The ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. The male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between his, its eyes is the first king. Does anybody want to guess who the first king was? Alexander the Great? As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall rise out of that nation, but not with its own power. All right, so that was just a little peek of what, what the, the play that was being written roughly 300 years before these events unfolded, right? So Gabriel, Daniel has a dream. He's really shaken up. Gabriel shows up and interprets this dream for him. Uh, essentially um, unfolding the, if you would, you know, another act in in our play, the fullness of time. In 332 BC, Alexander the Great. Alexander is is um, he is the large horn that's referred to in in uh, verse 21 there, Daniel 8:21. Alexander the Great began advancing his armies towards Egypt. He led his armies down into Syria, planning to overthrow the Jewish city of Jerusalem. According to the ancient historian Josephus, upon Alexander's arrival in Jerusalem, the chief priest read to him Daniel's prophecies about his rise to power, so impressing him that he left Jerusalem unharmed. In 330 B.C., Alexander the Great, though greatly outnumbered, uh, defeated the Persians at the Battle of Gagamah. I have that in my notes. Gogamela. Gogamela. The, um, and established the vast Greek empire. Let me jump over here. There's a picture of what we just described and what, Daniel, what Daniel's vision was there in Daniel 8. And sorry, we don't have time to... We're running a little bit behind. I'm just trying to keep us on track. Um, in 323 B.C., at the age of 33, Alexander the Great died without an heir. So, um, again, back to Daniel 8, written 300 years prior, right? 300, roughly, years prior. We have this portrait of Gabriel telling uh, Daniel, hey, the large horn between its eyes is the first king that we just spoke about, Alexander, Right? As for the broken horn and the four horns that stood, we're just getting ready to, to talk about the four horns that come out after the, the great horn breaks. Again, all prophesied back in Daniel. By the way, um, as, as most of you in this audience know that uh, scholars hate Daniel, right? Because how, how could anybody, you know, know what's going on? And how could anybody predict this accurately, what was going to happen in human history? So there's always this big controversy about, you know, when was Daniel written? Um, 
by some really intellectual folks. Uh, intellectual. The, um, at the same time, uh, another, just a side note here, um, it, as Alexander has conquered and, and, and the shift of power has moved over to the West, guess what becomes kind of the lingua franca of, of, of the known world at that time? It's Koine Greek. Right? So that's just an interesting side note. We'll come back to that in a minute. His huge empire was eventually divided into four sections. Remember the four small horns that we talked about in Daniel 8? Each ruled by one of his military leaders. <clears throat> Lysimachus, Cassander, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. The goat's horns of Daniel's vision was broken and four smaller horns appeared. Skip over that. So now let's talk a little bit about Greek rule. Two of these rulers were important during the 400 silent years. So two of the four rulers now were focused in on two specific rulers of those four. Ptolemy's dynasty included Egypt, North Africa, and Judea. Remember the kingdom's divided right now. You've got the northern and the southern kingdom, right? So Judea is also known as the southern kingdom. Seleucus ruled Syria, which included part of Israel, formerly known as the, as the northern kingdom. In 312 BC, Seleucus attempted to take Judea from Egyptian control, making Judea into a battleground between Syria and Egypt. Though Egypt and Syria were both Greek ruled, they spent 100 years fighting each other because both wanted to control the lucrative caravan, caravan routes that came through there. The same routes that God intended the Jews to use to evangelize the world. So, so you have, a, let's paint a real quick historic picture here. So you have Alexander the Great, he comes in he, and he conquers and he brings in Koine Greek. And this is prophesied in Daniel 8, 20, 21, 22, as the great horn on the goat, the goat that never touches the ground. Um, and then you have these four kings, Alexander dies suddenly, Quine Greek is the lingua franca of the world, of the known world at the time. Um, and, and then the four smaller horns come up. And then of those four smaller horns, we've got uh, Ptolemy and Selu uh, Seleucus fighting over Israel. right? And then why do they want Israel? Well, Israel is kind of, if you will, kind of the center of the ancient world. And so you have all of these um, trade. Uh, everything around the world, from an economics perspective, is, is routes through Israel. And, and um, so you've got Ptolemy, and, and you know, they're looking at this, you know, hey, this is a good way to make some money, right? Uh, let's get control of, uh, of, these, uh, of these routes. But it's still, if you, if you step back and look at this from the divine perspective, right, we can see that uh, maybe there's something else going on behind the scenes, right? Well, well man makes his plan, right? Uh, these long... Wars turned the land of Israel into a constant battleground. And we don't have time because we're running a little bit behind, so we won't go into the detail in this, but this is prophesied um, quite succinctly and, and, and in very vivid detail in Daniel chapter 11. During this time of Greek rule, many Judean Jews made Greek philosophy their way of life. Also during this time, the sects of the Sadducees and the Pharisees began. And so what you have now is kind of a, a cultural battle inside of um, Israel between the Sadducees who, who, who kind of adopted the Greek philosophy and the Greek way of doing things, and then the Pharisees who stuck with tradition, right? And, and so both of these, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, right, they hated each other. You know, essentially the, the Sadducees had, you know, given over, and, and the Pharisees, we're trying to keep tradition, but both groups got it wrong, and they both hated each other. Uh, very interesting uh, that they came together when our Lord showed up, though, right? The Sadducees formed a political and social sect that embraced Greek culture. The Pharisees resisted Greek culture, instead maintaining strict adherence to the law, to the law of Moses, as well as to their own arbitrary traditions. And so you have the, um, you know, the arbitrary traditions here are the additional uh, however many rules, uh, Robbie probably knows, but 600 and um, the extra 1,500, uh, 613. 
613, thank you, rules that uh, they, uh, they, they built kind of this wall around their tradition and, and, and in trying to do a good thing and trying to protect what, what the Lord had told them to do, um, they became very legalistic um, and, and to the point, you know, this is a big point of controversy when our Lord shows up um, with the Pharisees. You see these battles between the Pharisees where they, they accuse him of not obeying the law uh, when in fact, um, you know, we know that our, law, our Lord fulfilled the law perfectly. Well, it's because he was obeying the law that was given at Sinai, not the law that the Pharisees imposed over this 400 years. And you, you can see that they were trying to do a good thing, right? You have this political tension internally in, in uh, Israel between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees are adop- adopting the Greek ways. The Pharisees, you know, they're, they're fighting to preserve... Um, but in the end, they got it wrong. They got it wrong because they didn't understand the power. But we'll get more into that later. The, uh, in 284 B.C., because most Israelites had forgotten the Hebrew language, language, a group of 70 Hebrew scholars translated the Old Testament Scripture from Hebrew to Greek. So, so we have Alexander conquers the Eastern world. He kind of takes over, the West dominates. Koine Greek becomes the lingua franca of the known world at the time. At the same time, you have uh, this, um, all of these caravans, all of these economic routes running right through uh, Israel. And, and you have these two kings battling over them. And then somewhere in the background are, uh, are 70 scholars that are translating the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. Hmm, interesting. This translation was called the Septuagint, meaning 70. Uh, many quotes in the New Testament are from the Greek translation rather from the original Hebrew. Even today, Bible scholars go to the Septuagint when studying the original meaning of Old Testament scriptures. In 203 B.C., Antiochus the Great of Greek Syria, the Seleucid Empire, took the land of Judea from Egypt and Ptolemaic and the Ptolemaic Kingdom and captured Jerusalem, all of which had been prophesied in Daniel 11. And just for the sake of time, uh, we're not going to have an opportunity to go to Daniel 11. One of Antioch's sons, Antiochus Epiphanes, was a cruel hater of Israel, anti-Semitic, and a type of the Antichrist. So let's talk a little bit about Antiochus um, Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes destroyed many Old Testament scrolls, replaced the high priestly genetic line of Aaron with an unqualified person of his choosing. So he's getting in there and really, really messing with Israel. He defied the temple by setting up a statue of a Greek god, Zeus, inside the temple and offering a pig on the altar. And this is talked about in Daniel eleven twenty one through 31. Something similar to the abomination of desolation will be enthroned in the future tribulational temple, uh, Daniel. So what we have with Antiochus is a type of, um, a type of Antichrist that will occur uh, during the tribulational period. Um, during this time we have... Uh, the Maccabeans, okay, from 165 to 63 B.C. Uh, and in 168 B.C., Matthias, a Judean priest, led a rebellion against evil king Antiochus, as prophesied in Daniel 11, 32 through 34. After Matthias' death, his son Judas, Judas Maccabeus, continued the fight against Antiochus in battles known as the Maccabean Revolt. The Maccabean Revolt. Even though greatly outnumbers, even though greatly outnumbered, the Jews won victory after victory. In 165 BC, Judas Maccabeus finally reclaimed control of the temple. The Syrian army continually attacked Judea, but Israel's self-rule lasted from 164 to 63. So, so you have this period in in uh, in Israel's history where um, uh, Judas Maccabeus. Right, he's gotten the temple back. He's gotten control of Israel back, and uh, but you know you still have um, 
the Syrian Empire, right, who's, who's vying to get control. So you've got this back and forth. And this goes on for roughly 60 years. Um, and then enter the Romans. Um, Roman rule and influence began around 63 B.C. Around 63, Antipater, an Edomite ruler of Edomenia, Edomia, <laughs> together with two kings, laid siege against Jerusalem. His goal was to take rule of Jerusalem away from the Maccabean rulers. Antipater and his league paid Roman general Pompey to join them. Pompey conquered Judea for the Roman Republic. In 40 BC, the Roman Senate made Antipater governor of Judea. Antipater was the first in the Herodian dynasty. He appointed his son as kings, one over Galilee and the other over Judea. The son who ruled Judea was Herod the Great. Later that year, Antigonus, a Maccabean king priest, regained control of Judea and Jerusalem. In 37 BC, the Romans executed Antigonus, thus ending the Maccabean rule. So Rome has kind of inserted itself into our little play here, um, and in a really major way, as we'll, as we'll see as, as we develop the life of Christ. Um, let's talk a little bit about Herod the Great, um, introduced by, uh, by Roman control. Herod the Great took control of all Galilee and Judea and ruled there when Christ was born, which is Matthew uh, 2, 1 through 2. The people of Israel were under Roman rule throughout the New Testament period. They looked for a political ruler to free them from Rome's tyranny. In 31 BC, Caesar Augustus became emperor of Rome of the Roman Empire and ruled as dictator. In 19 BC, King Herod, an Edomite, started the, renovating the Second Temple because he longed to be a Jew. Sometime between 4 and 7 B.C., according to our calendar, Jesus Christ our Lord was born in Bethlehem, the city of David. Luke 2.11. So that, um, that brings us to... Where Brett picks up. Um, so real quick, uh, we're going to wrap up here. I'm going to turn this over to Brett, but I, I want to grab this last, uh, kind of ran through that last um, maybe 10 minutes here and, and kind of paint, if you would, uh, take, take your imagination and put yourself um, in, in place of a Jew that with all this turmoil that's going on, right? So, you know, the northern and southern kingdoms have been divided. And there's been battles raging uh, between, uh, you know, uh, Ptolemy and Seleucus to control, and you're involved in all this, and, and yet you're still longing for a king. Um, and, and then uh, Judas Maccabeus comes along, and, and, um, and he, he rescues, basically rescues Israel. You know, he, he fights these wars, they regain control of the temple, and then suddenly they lose it again. And so this is the stage, right, that our Lord comes into. So you have, you have the Jews, the Israelites, they want a king, and, and for the most part, when, they, when they're thinking of a king, they're thinking of someone that's going to deliver them from Roman rule um, and, and a Messiah that would deliver them. And so they're thinking of an earthly king. And, and so you'll see a lot of this developed as Jesus interacts with the Pharisees, the, the, the representative leadership of the Jews, and, he, and even some individual Jews where, you know, a lot of times they ask questions where, you know, we have the advantage of looking back in history uh, with all this information, and, and you know, we can kind of put our impression on it. But a lot of times, you know, they truly desire to know the truth. And but even still, when when our Lord would share the truth with them, um, because many of them, not all of them, but many of them, because their hearts were darkened with legalism and and the law, and they didn't understand uh, who and what the Messiah was, even though He was there with them. And uh, so, anyway. Um, 
So what we'll do, it's, it's uh, 3 o'clock. We're actually back on schedule. We know we got started late, so that's great. Um, we'll take a 10-minute break, and uh, we'll meet back here at 10 after 3. And then I think Brett is up. Are you up second? Is that right? Yes. And then Brett is up. Thank you.